race, conversations, and law enforcement. This is Moses' People Speak. Hello everyone, hello everyone out there. This is Terry Watson. Welcome to another episode of Moses' People Speak. Again, I'm your host, Terry Watson, and the founder of Strategies for Justice. Uh, today, we have a great, great conversation started today uh, with our live version. Yes, we are live, so please go ahead and comment if I see a good question. I will display it. Uh, but before we get started with, with uh, Dr. Dwayne, who is waiting so peacefully in the back, I wanted to just do a quick, some quick announcements. Uh, first, I want to say that uh, please stay to the end. There is actually going to be a musical tribute to uh, Brianna, Ahmad, and George Floyd. You don't want to miss that. Um, and so please stay to the end. Um, so there's a couple of things before we get started. Uh, again, uh, you're tuning in for episode nine, discussing race in America with Dr. Dwayne Wright. Uh, but before, but I want to talk about some future things happening with Strategies for Justice. Uh, one, uh, next week, we're going to have Miss Carrie Horn on. She is the ex-police officer in Buffalo, New York. Uh, she was fired uh, for stopping the choking of a Black man who was handcuffed. So she's going to be joining us to talk about what life's been like after that and also what she's trying to do with passing Carrier's law. Uh, if you've been following Strategies for Justice, you would know that we are looking to doing a symposium on conscious law enforcement and inclusive practices uh, in April of 2021. But until then, we're going to hold these forums on conscious law enforcement. So the very first one is going to be on June 29th. It's going to feature Sergeant Heather Taylor, uh, who is the president of the Ethical Society uh, for Police, uh, Captain Sonia Pruitt, who is the national uh, the president, the national chairwoman for the National Black Police Association, and my brother uh, uh, Damon K. Jones, who's a New York rep for Black and Law Enforcement of America. You don't want to miss that discussion. The topic is law enforcement responding to the generational trauma in the Black community. Uh, and follow that in July, we already have set up uh, the, the the conversation is going to be the legalities for policies and the laws in times of injustice. And our two guests, Jonathan Newton, who is the president of the National Association Against Police Brutality and former detective Ken Williams. Okay, so with that said, let's have this conversation. Don't know if you guys seen it yet, but I do want to make sure you have the opportunity to understand why we're here today and what we're going to be talking about. So if you haven't had a chance to see it, let's check out this quick video real fast. Will you please stop? Sorry, I'm asking you to stop. Please don't come close to me. Sir, I'm asking you to stop recording me. Please don't come close to me. Please take your phone off. Please don't come close to me. Please, please call the cops. Please call the cops. I'm going to tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. Please tell them whatever you like. Excuse me. I'm sorry, I'm in the ramble, and there is a man, African American, who has a bicycle helmet. He is recording me and threatening me and my dog. There is an African American man, I am in Central Park. He is recording me and threatening myself and my dog. <laughs> and my dog. I'm sorry, I can't hear you either. I'm being threatened by a man in the ramble. Please send the cops immediately. I'm in Central Park in the ramble. Thank you. Okay, so that was the film. So with that, I'd like to bring on my brother, Dr. Dwayne. Uh, so I'm gonna unmute you, bro. All right, thank you. How you doing, brother? Good afternoon, good afternoon, good evening. It's six o'clock, you know, we all been on lockdown. How you doing, Terry? Good to see you again. How you feeling, brother? Man, I am doing well. It's, it's great to catch up with you. It's been a long time since I had a chance to talk to you. So I am so excited that you Going to be the uh, the first one to knock this live broadcast on. So oh, okay, uh, okay. I feel privileged, this... honor, my brother. Privileged and honored. <laughs> now listen up, guys. If you have a question, I'm going to look at the chat box from time to time. Go ahead and submit it. But I want to get started with having this conversation. So, my brother Dwayne, tell me when you first saw that video. What was the first thing that came to your mind? Well, 
So let me first say, I want to start by thanking you, Terry, for having this, thanking any guests that might be on the phone call for listening, because we're clearly in the midst of a national conversation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's 6 p.m. For some people, it might be right around dinner time. For some people, they might be getting off of work. And if you are listening today, first of all, thank you. The second thing I want to say before I react to the video is, I don't know about you, Terry, but no one I don't think is here to bash Amy Cooper. She did what she did and it's done. She lost her job. Um, there are many other consequences. You know, this will be what's on the internet is forever, Terry. You know, That's so this true. will be forever connected to some incidents she had nothing to do with, including the execution of Ahmaud Arbery and then the murder lynching of our dear brother George Floyd, which happened just days after. Right. right. However, with those caveats said, let me express this. What I saw then and I see now is the authorization of white tears against an African-American male. Mm. And not just any African-American male. Chris Cooper, no relation, by the way, right, uh, right. is the best of us. And I'm not sure what that means, but <laughs> we're talking about a brother that is, you know, Harvard educated and was, was bird watching in the world. <laughs> you know? I'm from New York City, Terry. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, born and raised. You know, in East, well, not born, I was born in Trinidad, but at least raised in East Flatbush. So I understand, right. you know, if you're in the Ramble bird watching, that's not usually what brothers do. <laughs> that, um, that's and true. You think that, you know, and when she's on the phone, the thing that keeps standing out to me was that she was having more difficulty with the dog than she was with Chris, <laughs> but was then treating Chris like a dog. Right. You know I understand she then came and talked on CNN and said she might have been scared, but certain words don't come to you. You know, if you're in the mm -hmm. ramble, you know, you're there, you're not sure what's going on. Maybe you say someone's threatening me. But before right. she got on the phone and after she got on the phone, she says numerous times African-American as if that should mean something to the cops more mm -hmm. than just her fear. So when that happens, brother, you cannot tell me it's just about the fear. You know, so that was my reaction, but you know, we, 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 we need to just contextualize this conversation for the folks on the phone a little bit. Right, this right. happened just about a couple of weeks after Aubrey in South Carolina. Right. This happened just a few days before George Floyd. And I want to lift up the name of Anala Burton, who is a mm. freelance writer out of Denver, Colorado, who actually pinned the article that found out or was in the independent that Amy Cooper was a liberal. And it was yes. that article that I retweeted that you picked up on. And as uh, you know, our, our African American and Latina uh, sisters don't get enough credit. I'll make sure that Nala Burton gets the credit for writing that article. Um, right. And you know, right. that what was the emphasis for this conversation. And you know, what it shows is that one, she had no value for Mr. Cooper. She was breaking the rules and then tried to assert herself and her whiteness in a way that trumped his ability and his right to bird watch. Mm. We're not talking about being in the club, Terry. We're not talking about bird <laughs> We're talking about, about bird watching. You understand? So that was my reaction to the video. You know, I, I can I tell you one thing? I, I and. We had a guest email us earlier about this too. Mm -hmm. The panic in her voice that that uh -huh. that was that was some true anxiety, right? You know, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, you could you could you could say wherever it came from. That was some true anxiety, you know. So my 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 thing is, why does that anxiety exist to see a brother? I mean, in, in this case, bird watching. I mean, the, the the worst thing he could have in his hand is, is binoculars, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's the worst thing. What well, you, what, you know, what what happened was he was giving treats to the dog, which I'm told, because uh, I don't bird watch, <laughs> not my thing. <laughs> just, just put that out there. But I'm told that this is a uh, a typical technique that bird watchers use when a dog is off the leash. You know, when I yeah. was growing up, I was terribly afraid of dogs. You know, I would run away. Some people are just afraid of dogs. Yes. But clearly she had more concern for the dog than she had for whatever Mr. Cooper was doing. But mm. let me try to answer the question, the, the viewer's question, Terry, in this way. When I see this video, I first don't think about 2020. I first think about 1876. Uh-oh. 
and a race riot that happened in Elton, South Carolina in 1876, where mm. 110 uh, that we know of African Americans were slain because yeah. someone was accused of whistling mm -hmm. at a white woman. Yes. Then I see forward to 1921, and I know about the Tulsa riots. Mm -hmm. It actually happened because someone went into an elevator being accused of whistling at a white woman. Then I speak together one year after the Brown versus Board of Ed in 1955. And for those of you that know, don't know what happened there, that was Emmett Till. Mm. Lynched and murdered again after being accused of whistling at a white woman. So what do we need to move past the fear? I think we need to move to a place where the non-white people in America no longer socialize and acculturate their brothers, sisters, and daughters to fear blackness. And mm. I'm not talking about black people because right. the fear name of Cooper's voice was not about Chris Cooper. So if you see the brother on any interviews and with his glasses, uh, it's not fearful at all. This is the furthest thing from Tupac a brother can do. <laughs> and I, I don't mean that in a disparaging or disrespectful way. Right, but right. we have been trained to fear blackness. And I'll tell you what, Terry, not just white people, right. black people too. Now you indoctrinated and cultured to fear blackness and anything associated to blackness, unless mm -hmm. what? Unless they're consuming it. They will pay a ticket to watch LeBron James and mm -hmm. then see someone that looks nothing like anything but LeBron James and cross the street. You know, I want to look at a comment here from from Andrew T. Thanks mm -hmm. for making that comment. It, it says she escalated her anxiety three times to weaponize the police because she knew Cooper's life would be in danger. Mm -hmm. so, so, so let me say this, I, I, I hear you, Andrew, and I hesitate uh, as a lawyer to read into people's intentions. I, you know, I'm not gonna do that, um, even though- I will. Personally, <laughs> I might agree with your statement. But let me say right. this, clearly she thought that by mentioning African-American, she was gonna get a different result. Mm -hmm. And that alone is what we need to know about America. Because if you're truly threatened in the ramble, what does the race of the person mean matter at all? <laughs> Terry, you're a black, black guy. If you come after me with a knife and I get on the phone, the last thing I'm talking about is he's got a knife. <laughs> African-American, why does that matter? So, Andrew, to your point, clearly she knows something that if it's not intentional, because I don't know her intentions, is right. unconscious and incorporated into the legacy, the vervet nature of America. And that mm -hmm. is African-American equals violent, African-American equals guilty, African-American equals help me, even if I'm doing something wrong. You know what, I, I wanna say this because I just got off an interview with a, mm -hmm. um, with a national press. And uh, the question they asked me was, um, about hiring black law enforcement. And I, I, and I don't want to switch gears on this one, but I, I said to them, one of the most dangerous things I could uh, advise a police chief mm. or anyone in leadership is to hire someone based on the color of their skin. Mm. But because here's the problem with that, and I call mm. it, it's, it's presentation without true representation, mm. okay? You hire someone who do not have the consciousness Right, and you mm -hmm. bring them in thinking you made a good statement. Yeah, that's going to bring more damage to the community than mm -hmm. by hiring someone who has a consciousness, you know. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the 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 mindset that I'm referring to when I say that is what you said. The their their mindset is you're being indoctrinated. The same mm -hmm. the same education that a white person have, I would have, and so mm -hmm. therefore the same biases mm -hmm. might come about too. So. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I I like your point there. So you know, let, let me let me let me say something too. What 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 do you think, uh, uh, Dwayne, that uh, America should take away from this incident? Well, first, I think America should take away this. This is not the first, and it won't be the last incident, because mm -hmm. America is designed, built, um, fortitude, rebuilt after wars on the backs and um, slave labor of black and brown people. And I'm not just talking about slavery that ended in the 19th century. After slavery in the 19th century, we had 20, 25 years of Jim Crow. 
After mm -hmm. 20, 25 years of Jim Crow, we had a civil rights movement that cost us the lives of not just black people like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, but white people such as JFK and Robert F. Kennedy. You understand? So I think America could, should take away that this is what America is. You know, not that, you know, this sort of signing city on the hill, that might be true in some instances, but this is what America is. Mm -hmm. The next thing that America should take away is we are responsible for this. Don't think Amy Cooper is some individual who you can wrap up in a bow, throw away, fire, and you don't have a personal responsibility as a white person if you're sitting on this phone or as a person of color if you support this to change. Until we, you know, so, so, so Terry, can, can I take a little time to tell you the two myths we have in America very quickly? Oh, get to it, man. Get to it, brother. So there are two myths that generate America. First, it's the myth of colorblindness. The <laughs> myth that somehow, even though we had 200, 300 years of color-centric policies that put African-Americans down, now we could just forget about it and move on with colorblindness. Best articulated in Chief Justice Roberts and parents involved the decision that, of course, the way to stop racial discrimination is just to stop discriminating on race. The yes. other myth we have that this incident defeats is the myth of meritocracy. The mm -hmm. myth that everyone in America who works hard gets what they should deserve, and mm -hmm. everyone who has something that we think they deserve, riches, fame, have worked hard for it. And these two myths, whether you be liberal, conservative, or otherwise, are what America is built on. And until we truly and honestly tackle what has been built on these myths, we're not going to get anywhere. You know, I want to I want to point out a comment made by uh, I think it's Kizzy Nicholas. Uh, it said, you know, but let's not give it a nice name like anxiety. It was ignorance, self righteousness. Brother, you want to comment on that? Well, what it is, is white privilege. Mm -hmm. And white privilege can translate something like anxiety into Kizzy, that ignorance and self-righteousness. Mm -hmm. The privilege to think that you can have a dog, have it off on the leash, and then when someone comes to tell you to put it away, you can call the cops. During a pandemic, <laughs> so it's like the place in New York didn't have something else to deal with. You could have taken your dog and moved somewhere else five feet away. You could have there are a million other things. But when you again, when you grow up, you know, yes. you the privilege, equality feels like oppression. And mm. then when that false oppression falls on you, we get the ignorance, the arrogance, the self-righteousness. And then as soon as you're called out on it, you the white tears come. The white tears come. I'm sorry, I didn't know. I'm sorry, I'm really not racist. And you know, I, I agree with Chris Cooper. I don't know if Amy is racist, but what she right. did was undoubtedly racist. And it passed far past time that we started holding each other as Americans accountable for our actions. Let me let me let me piggyback on what you said. How, how do we do that? How do we hold each other accountable for calling people out? And, and you know, because one thing I say, you know, Dwight, you know, and uh, I. I uh, the first time I heard you, your arguments about the first versus the 13th Amendment, I love that, by the way. And I, I'm going to put that plug in. If you're still doing that presentation, uh, I, would, I, would, I would say anyone had the opportunity to listen to that should definitely listen to that argument. But how do we hold each other accountable when people can't even talk about racism or white supremacy? Like if you can't even have that at the, the, the kitchen table anymore. You know, what, 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 what can we do to to hold each other accountable for that? Well, first we need to be brave. Mm, we need yeah. to have the, the, the courage to have brave conversations and quite frankly, the courage to give up your privilege. You know, mm -hmm. I, I went to, a, as you know, I went to a predominantly white law school yes. and the best conversations I had with my classmates uh, years ago now when I went to law school were ones in which they didn't come to me for education, but they came to me for, I want to say salvation, but that's too biblical. They came to me <laughs> understanding <Amen. laughs> that, 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 you know, to whom much is given, much is required. And a lot of white people, well-meaning white people, for far too long have been taking a lot and have not been called to bear to pay for it. Mm. And you pay for it while, you know, helping someone out. 
So the next time, you know, that African-American female puts something out there, don't steal her idea, give her credit for it. Mm -hmm. The next time you're on a hiring committee, we have a lot of people from universities on the call today, I'm sure. Yes, we do. Next yes, time we do. You're on a hiring committee and you're looking at, you know, someone from Harvard, Yale, Stanford, why don't you give the brothers from Howard a try? <laughs> and, you know, this is not one thing. So if you're here, you know, white, black, different or otherwise looking for one thing that you can do, I don't have those answers for you. Because there wasn't yeah. one thing that made African Americans in this country tired. <laughs> <laughs> the excessive racism. It was years and years and years. And I can go back and tell you stories from Brooklyn, New York, to Hampton and Norfolk, Virginia, to State College, PA. You know, so I'm not asking for one thing, but to actively and intentionally try to reverse what has happened, even if you're not responsible for it. Again, I am not here to hold anyone responsible. I am here to empirically tell you what the situation is today and ask your help to try to change it. And help means action. It doesn't mean words. It doesn't mean a retweet, even though I appreciate those. It means actual concrete actions when you have the power to do something. And many yeah. people have the power to do something and are willing to exercise the exorcism of their privilege in mm. every instance, except when they have power. Mm. There is someone on, on the YouTube channel right now, mm. and, it's, and, and I don't know their real name, but it's T... Uh, uh, I'm thinking this. Oh, too real. Oh, nine. Thank you. Two, I'm sorry, <laughs> brother. You know, I, I, I try. <laughs> yeah, I got oh, nine. So vulnerability is hard. You have to peel back the layers, and it's scary. Uh, I want that you open that one up, brother. Well, let me say this. Being a black man in America is scary. Being a black man in America with dreads is scary. And Terry, I have five academic degrees. Some of them are behind me right now. You understand? Yeah. So who, if not you, who are you willing to let be scared to allow you not to be scared? Mm. That is my question. <laughs> if mm. you're not, I know it's scary, but if you're not willing to do the work, understand that someone has to do the work for you. And my right. question is, if you see us all as Americans, who are you willing to allow to do that work for you so you don't have to do it? Right. And I understand that we have to peel it back. And I'm willing to have this conversation, any conversation you wish to get you to the point where we need to do it. But what I have absolutely no patience for is people who want people of color to unpack your whiteness. The time mm. for that is dead. It died with George Floyd. Mm. You have to do the work to unpack your whiteness. You have to. I'm willing to help because I'm an educator. Don't put that in all. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right, right. You understand, but you have to do the work and be scaffolded with other people, but putting that on someone else. And I'm not, you know, I'm not, the comment isn't addressed to the commenter because I'm not right. sure of the commenter's race. It's just mm -hmm. the comment. Putting that on someone else is exercising your white privilege. And if you take nothing away from this conversation, stop exercising the privilege and start using that privilege to do better. Can I give you one quick story, Terry? Because I love stories. Yeah, please do. And, I, and I, by the way, I, I know who the commenter was because they comment who it was is my brother Divine, uh, who who also talks. You know, he he's also I I I tease him all the time. I say he's going to change the world, but okay. he's, he's Shout following, out to only incarcerated. Shout yes, out right. Only incarcerated. He's, he's going to make it happen. I believe it. But I wanted to tell you a story. Go on, go on. Yeah, so Ella Ella Fitzgerald was mm -hmm. denied access to sing in many um, clubs and institutions. Right. So here's what Marilyn Monroe did. She said, I, because she was famous at the time, will come to the clubs, buy a table, and sit in the front row if you let Ella sing. Mm. And over half of the places that were all white places that Ella Fitzgerald sang in was as a result of Marilyn Monroe paying her, using her own money and sitting in the front row to allow Ella to sing. That is how you use your privilege, both economic and racial, to help solve the problem. Right, right. You know, that's a that's a really good point, man. Uh, I, I, I had this conversation uh, actually not so long ago uh, with a group of folks, and uh, this this open discussion what I do, right? So when I talk to my white brothers and sisters, I always say, when you see injustice, speak and act, mm -hmm. right? And I, I always encourage them to use their their voice 
when they see injustice to speak out on that injustice. Mm -hmm. I want to I want to play that devil's advocate now because you see mm -hmm. uh, there is a, a movement to silence white voices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Now, now I I have a problem with that, and and not and don't get me wrong. There is a time for black voices and black spaces. Mm -hmm. okay? I don't. I I would never say that that's not the case. But I'm going around telling my white brothers and sisters, I need you to speak out and act out yeah. when yes. you see yes. justice. Yes. Okay. But I want you to comment on that. So I see uh, the great uh, Professor Emeritus Charles Demar said that they were over 2,000 black, uh, white kids, excuse me, at a Black Lives Matter demonstration. And I think that kind of speaks yeah. to your, your question too. Um, right. And so so here's the, the, the skinny of it. We as America will never get anywhere if we isolate ourselves, mm. you understand? And you're not talking to someone that advocates uh, for a glorification of whiteness to get this done. I am one of the people along with uh, Dr. Michael Wood and you know uh, Dr. DeAndre Wilson that founded the Black and Latino Male Empowerment Club yes, at Penn State. And we never, ever excluded white people from that meeting. So That's I right. think there's a fine line and to Charles' point that needs to uh, be told. And the told is you can allow white allyship without exalting whiteness in your space. You understand? Mm -hmm. so if you need whiteness to get something done, I think that's wrong. But if you're inviting white people, and now let's just you know, I don't know how deep you want me to get right now. Well, you know white what? And I, white I, I, people I, I, are not the same thing. You understand whiteness is a culture and an acculturation that uses anti-blackness to deviate and devalue something to the neoliberal exaltation of something else. Mm. So just because you are a white person does not necessarily mean you need to invest yourself in whiteness. And to Charles' point, I welcome all my white brothers and sisters to the cause as long as you recognize that there is no exaltation of whiteness here that is necessary and needed. Right. Uh, well, you know, I, I want to talk about something, Dallas, and uh, I know uh, we, 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 uh, Dive into just a little bit, but mm -hmm. um, someone here, uh, Kay Barrington, is asking, "What steps need to be taken? Where yeah. do we start?" Yeah, so so that's actually my brother. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. But, um, <laughs> what what steps? I think the first step has to go back. You know, and I I, I, I hesitate to talk so academic because I think the time calls for more practical words. Right. But right. the first step is to defeat these two myths both within America and to be honest, within places of color. And the two myths again are the myth of colorblindness and the myth of meritocracy. Here's how the myth of colorblindness works. I don't have to hire anyone that's African-American. I'm just gonna hire the best person for the job. And if that person is only one African-American for the past 10 years, there's no problem with that. Damn that. Mm -hmm. There is a problem with that. There is a problem with that, you understand, because you're sending the implicit message that the people that are good are only white people, and the people that are good that are African American are once in a lifetime. Mm. The other myth that we need to defeat is the myth of meritocracy. The myth that you need five degrees to have a conversation like this. I went to school because I enjoyed it, <laughs> and my mother installed in me at an early age the value of education. And my father was a former teacher, you understand? But there, there, are, there, there needs to be a space for African-Americans that aren't like me. The people that make it out the hood can't be the exceptional ones because it's not like that for white America. Can I give you one more step to, yeah. to the question? Me too. We need to understand our own biases mm. and we need to operate on that. I understand that I am biased toward people from the Caribbean <laughs> because I happen to be born in the Caribbean. So I make sure in my admissions, because I work for George Washington University at the current moment, and in everything I do in my advising, that I check my biases at the door. That's not colorblindness, but that's mm -hmm. understanding my biases. 
Yes, yes. And you know, I um I, I, I love that point that you made, you know, because I, I wanna buy this shirt. I, I've been saying I'm gonna do it for years, but I'm gonna do it for real. I wanna buy a shirt, make a shirt that says, Ask me about my bias. Mm. Mm. And I want to invite people because I did a I, I have a series of programs it's called Stupid Things That Good People Say. <laughs> and I remember the first time I proposed to do this program, people were like, oh, no, 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 let's not call it Stupid Things. And I said, no, that's what it is. We're not, you know, people do and say ignorant things, but all, the does, does, all the time. But that's it. I do. I, I do. I, I I think I do more apologizing for it these days, though. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> but you know. so, so, so Terry, can I just interject there? Let me say something before this gets lost because I know uh, I have a lot of white friends from State College. There are probably a lot of white people on this call. Mm -hmm. Saying and doing ignorant things is much different than staying in blissful ignorance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. saying and doing ignorant things can be forgiven. Yes. Staying in blissful ignorance, especially but not exclusively after the last couple of months, is on you. Yeah. And you got to own that. You understand? Mm -hmm. So there's someone in your family that needed to be here for this conversation. I'm sure it will be available on YouTube. Send it to them. There's yeah. someone in your family that didn't even know. It might be from South Carolina about the yep. 1876 Elton race riots. Send that information to them. We cannot no longer stay in blissful ignorance. I can forgive your ignorance as an educator, and I'm here to educate, but you need to be able and opening to have those strong and hard conversations. Absolutely. You know, I got to tell you, I had a pleasure of conversing with uh, Jane Elliott, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, she did the, the blue eye, brown eye experiment back in the, uh, I think the, in the 60s, right? In the 60s. Okay, was assassinated, mm -hmm. the day after mm -hmm. he was assassinated. And she, she sees education as an educator, should I say, as mm -hmm. a person who brings them out of ignorance, right? That's how she sees uh, uh, the role of an educator. So I'm, I'm so glad that you're touching on that. You know, I want to bring up a comment that was made by uh, uh onila oh hi hey girl how you doing <laughs> all right we, we we go way back okay mm -hmm. uh, I, I, every time i see people come i feel older and older because i, I remember my students <laughs> so <laughs> I, my, my gray hair is my beard is not by hey, man, so i'm getting up there <laughs> <laughs> But here, here's a here's a conversation I really like to touch on because um, again, back to the Amy Cooper thing, I want to bring up the the Asian uh, and and Asian community as well mm. um, because uh, and I live right here uh, as a mixed woman, Asian white, I'm often criticized for not choosing a side and sticking with it. Uh, mm. When I call up my white friends, their defense is that I am also white. Mm -hmm. I am, and I have to check my privilege too. Mm -hmm. But as a minority woman, I also have found myself in situations where my brown skin has made a negative difference. How do I suggest balancing the mix of understanding racism on a personal level, but also understanding privilege? Now that that's an amazing, insightful mm -hmm. question. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I am extremely impressed and almost um, jawstruck by the complexity the vulnerability and the realness of that question, you know, and I, you know, I, I'm going to react to it, but I think reacting would almost be a little bit disrespectful. What I would love to do at some point after some introspection is have some conversation about that, you know, maybe some programming on it, uh, because I think it deserves more time than my, you know. Well, brother, you know, I'll give you an open invitation to most people speak, man. You know, I, I, <laughs> I love, love having get problem, but, but 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 to 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 offer some thoughts. Mm -hmm. Instead of an answer, let me say this. Too often people see racism as an individual thing. Mm -hmm. You understand? And they ignore the systemic and institutional part of it. So when as an individual, you try to call some people out, they keep it on that individual level mm -hmm. in order to avoid actually talking about the institutional and systemic problems of racism. So I understand the sister's point of I'm Asian and I'm white. And, you know, anytime I interjected, they say, check your privilege. You know, I understand the same thing, too. I may be an African-American, but I'm also a male. And that comes with some type of privilege in the world. I'm a, I'm a lawyer. You know, I have economic privilege. I have knowledge privilege. Right. But that is not what we're talking about. Right? If it was literally just one or two individuals 
we wouldn't be having this conversation because it's really about a systemic problem. So I would say, um, Nala, in talking with your friends, it's not about you. And it's honestly not about them. It's about how individuals come together to constellate and formulate a system of oppression and institutions that make African Americans, Latinos, and other people, our LGBT community, uh, less valued. Mm -hmm. And when you take it to the point of value, yes, you may need to check your privilege, but that should not force you to not talk about it. That's the exact same thing that should force you to use your privilege to talk about it more. And if any friends push back on that, say, well, okay, what is the solution? Should we just not talk about it? Mm -hmm. What is the solution? So you hear right now the call to dismantle cops. And, you know, for everyone that is wondering why we're not talking more about George Floyd, this particular conversation was actually scheduled before um, the tragic murder on tape of a black man whose last words were crying for his mother. He continues to break my heart today. But mm -hmm. on the Floyd point, just for a little bit, you know, we hear calls to dismantle the police. You understand? And I think that some certain communities should have that and certain communities should not. We should have the conversation. But to those people that are saying, oh, that's a pipe dream, what is your solution? Yeah. <laughs> and just give me platitudes and problems, bring me solutions. So, you know, I would love to explore that more, but that's just my knee jerk reaction to well, that well thought out question. Brother, let's let's talk about this because, you know, check, you know uh, I think I mentioned this already. Uh, this is the. Um, uh, trying to find that screen. This is the screen right here of uh, of the program. The first forum that we're doing is mm -hmm. going to be law enforcement responding to generational trauma in the Black community. Again, mm -hmm. it's going to feature uh, three uh, uh, individuals who are uh, heading or mm -hmm. representing uh, law enforcement um, organizations. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I've been doing this back work for years. Uh, yeah, I, you know, you, know yeah. Um, you, you remember when I first started the battle. You remember when I first started my the, my, yeah. my my yeah, I remember, program. I remember. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I I I've been saying to folks, you know, can we have a a, a conversation about the role the black police officer and black uh, police woman play in bridging the gap? Mm -hmm. Because you can imagine this. You go to, you know, everyone, you know, you might realize that the, the, the idea of having a bad job, right? You go to mm -hmm. job, you go to work, and you have to go over this crap. But you get home, you get to your community, mm -hmm. you can relax, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the black officer, that doesn't exist really, you see, because yeah. he mm -hmm. or she comes back to their community, and their community, go either, as my uncle said, see them on the other side. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, one one of the things that I'm I'm glad you brought up, you know, and we could dive into the because the, you're right. We we talked about by the way, people, the, these episodes they're they're typically planned about a month ahead of time. So if you hear if you hear an airing of it, uh, that means a month prior to that, I reached out to the guest. Sometimes a year when I did my, when I did Michael Blake story, that was a year the planning, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, sometimes you you we, we get these we have these uh, conversations, but talk about George Floyd for a second, mm -hmm. because, you know. Um, uh, I, I don't. I, I want. I want to make. I want to make a, a, a confession. Mm. Okay. I ain't watched the tape. Mm. You couldn't I, do it. I. You know, know what? I know how the story ends. Mm. Okay. I know how this movie ends. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I've seen the choking of Eric Garner mm -hmm. in New York because not that, that's 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 where I'm from, right? I watched, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. I watched the shooting of uh, of, of Tamara Rice. Yeah. As a matter of fact, two the last two episodes of Moses People Speak, they were families of people who had their who had loved ones die by police. My brother Kenneth Chamberlain Jr. in Westchester, mm -hmm. and, and Justice Howell in Chicago. And let's not forget our sister Sandra Bland. Breonna Taylor's murderers have still not been arrested. Don't not forget that, my brother. We we, you know what? I'm telling you right now, what, one of the things that was bothering me mm -hmm. was the fact that we're not talking about Brianna Moore. Mm. Because let, let's put this in perspective. Now, I'm not going to door Candace Owens. That's not what we're going to do. We're not going to talk about her today. Okay, brother? We're not going to talk about her today. Okay. 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 We don't got to. We don't got to. <laughs> but listen here for a second. Mm -hmm. When she came out with that anti George Floyd, uh, mm. uh, speech. I want to go back to your question. Is then what is the answer, Candace? What's the answer? 
because mm. you could easily be talking about Brianna right now. Yeah. Yeah. She was your model citizen, was she not? Yeah. She was during the COVID times, she was out mm -hmm. there trying to 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 give life to those who were sick, and she still got killed. Okay. So if you're going to use your platform, Candace, why don't you talk about Brianna? That's yeah, yeah, what I want. So, so I can't, I, I, I won't be able to, in a way that would make my mother proud, talk about Candace Owens in public uh, right now. So I'm by not the way, I, I guarantee you. By the way, your I, I talked, I talked to your aunt this this, this morning. She <laughs> told me up. She said, "Hey, how you get the link?" <laughs> so I heard you sent her the email. So if you're watching, I forgot your name. Uh, if, if you're watching, shout out to our phone call earlier today. Yes, yes, uh, yes, sure. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, so I'm not going to talk about Candace because I, I don't want to have a long phone conversation tonight. I already have too much work. But <laughs> let me give you some concrete things that we could do. Three concrete mm -hmm. things. One, we can end no knock warrants. Mm -hmm. And Brianna Taylor was murdered in such a fashion that the police without identifying themselves, busted into her home. In America, we love nothing more than property. You know, mm -hmm. we, we, if you saw the riots, we apparently like property more than people. Andrew yeah. Cuomo, I won't go there. <laughs> busted into her home in a way in which she thought she was being robbed. Mm -hmm. And she was murdered for defending herself with police officers that didn't identify themselves. In my opinion, as a legal scholar, I think we're on tenuous Fourth Amendment grounds. And in my opinion, as a human being, we should go and on a state level, we can do this to end no-knock warrants. The yeah. second thing we need to do is end or greatly reduce qualified immunity. Oh. Because we're in an instance where officers are literally allowed to do things that you and me, Terry, cannot do. Right. So I think we should, you know, there's a bill right now that has no chance of passing with this man in office, but the, to, to end qualified immunity, I think, you know, maybe ending it might go a little strong, but we definitely need to severely limit it. And I call upon police to actually join in this measure. You don't need qualified immunity to do your job. Trust me, you don't. And the last thing, as far as concrete steps we can do for our brothers and sisters um, like, you know, George Floyd and like Breonna Taylor, is finally when these things happen, not to let it go right away. Yes. The Montgomery boycott was over 100 days. You know, the civil rights movement was over five years. We in America, up until the point of COVID, you see the special thing that's going on right now, Terry, is you have a lot of people without jobs and with yes. nothing to do. So of course, when this happens, they hit the street. I would mm -hmm. love to hear some type of simulation, some type of research paper on the atmosphere with George Floyd without COVID. <laughs> in three, four months, when you're thinking, particularly our white allies, yes. to Charles Dumas' point, when you're thinking about something else, when you're thinking about going back to school, when you're thinking about tenure for my faculty members, when you're thinking about jobs for other people, you know, don't let this go away. I challenge you on December 31st, 2020, to have as much effort and as much force and as much flair in protesting and fighting for this stuff as you do today. So I think those three things, making sure that it doesn't die out, ending all no-knock warrants, and greatly limiting qualified immunity. Yes, I want to bring up, uh, there's a couple of comments, and I, I'm looking mm -hmm. at the time and being conscious of time, but mm -hmm. here, here's one, um, and, and this this one I, 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 I want you to take a look at. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, Can you see it, by the way, on your side? Yes, sir. Uh, you could great, um, and and I, I think this is a um, this is something that um, we talk about. Uh, the, who's responsible mm -hmm. for the education, mm -hmm. right? And um, probably like you though, I don't mind educating. I I, I have a mm -hmm. to me my energy comes from knowing that I possibly maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could could, could sh in his day. I don't educate to change people. Mm -hmm. I educate people to show them where they are. Okay, mm -hmm. you have to make that 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 choice if you want to change. If you don't like who you are, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But whose responsibility is that? Wow, that's that's a deep question because I don't think it's just one plain black and white answer. I mm -hmm. think the responsibility for education first lies within the individual because as free people in America in this society, first of all. We don't talk about American privilege. 
so much. And I've been so heartened to see our brothers and sisters, many white um, in other countries, France, um, you know, the Netherlands, et cetera, yes. join with us in this Black Lives Matters movement. We have a lot of privilege in America. You know, on a good day, you can vote. And I see my cousin and a, a GW graduate, uh, Melissa Henry, just said voting is, is your job. And I think, you know, while voting is your job, educate yourself before you vote, because I'm going to say something political and I'm just going to throw it out there. People know I try to, you know, at least feed both sides. I think if more people educated themselves before they vote, we wouldn't be in this situation because we wouldn't have a clown in the White House. And however you feel about it, that's how I feel. And you know, we can talk about it. Feel free to DM me, chat me, at me. It doesn't matter. That's how I feel. You understand? So I think the 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 topic first lies in the individual, but then I think it lies in the community. See, the thing that we fail to do in America, that's not in existence even in a lot of Eastern, but even in the Western Caribbean, is we're a very individualistic society. Mm -hmm. We think if we got it, that's it, you know? And it's not like that. It takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to help unlearn the poison toxins of whiteness that you have learned. Yes. So you it, you yeah. cannot rely just on yourself. However, that labor cannot be put on the backs of the people that you have oppressed in order to make it possible for you to need that labor. Right. So okay, I'm Dwayne Wright. I'm an African American male. I'm willing to educate you. Please do not assume that someone else is willing to do that. Mm -hmm. The same way we hold responsibility for our own taxes, our own money, hold responsibility for unpacking your whiteness yourself. Yes. And educate yourself. And then now this says this is not a racial statement. This is everyone participate in our democracy. Mm. Too many of our brothers and sisters in Detroit in Milwaukee, in Philadelphia, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, did not vote. Mm. And we, you know, I've had conversations about this and a lot of ways to go. We've got to go out. We've got to express our voice when we can. Because you saw last night in Georgia, where I spent a year in Savannah, shout out to our Savannah Law School grads, because uh -huh. we had our last class this year. You know, it was very hard to vote, yes. you know, and that's a shame. You know, we need to get another Voting Rights Act. But for yeah. those of you that can and are willing to stand in the lines until lawyers like us help you, uh, please do vote. But the responsibility, I think it first is in the person, but then it extends to the village. However you see your village, it extends mm -hmm. to the village. You know, I want to I want to touch on uh, so a comment from Debbie Little, you know, uh, that so Dwayne, you know, a little mm -hmm. bit about my previous Moses People Speak episodes and focuses on families who have lost loved ones due to police violence. And I, mm -hmm. those conversations are getting more and more difficult. You know, um, mm -hmm. one family in particular also had the same question too. Uh, uh, what, how do, you, how do you engage someone who is, uh, who, who may have known someone killed by police who's white in the same man like a chokehold mm -hmm. about privilege? Yeah, listen, this is why I separate whiteness and white people. Mm. One of the number one people that have been hurt by whiteness is white people. Mm. The book is called Dying by, of Whiteness. <laughs> you know, you could just pick it up and read it. Poor white people have been hurt in some instances as much as some rich black people by whiteness. So I understand to my brothers and sisters who have been hurt by police violence, which is used in a neoliberal way to pop up capitalism and whiteness and whiteness through capitalism, that you might not understand. How am I privileged? I lost a cousin, too. How am I privileged? I lost a brother, too. And to what I say is it's not an individual thing. Yeah. It's about a system and an institution that allows for that death and every other death, but excuses the black death in a different way. And then we, the, the thing about it in America, we put too much valiance and hierarchy on difference that, you know, if, you know, George Floyd gets, you know, shot with a knee and a white person, somehow we need to put a value on that. That's why we're always ranking everything and we're trying to do, no, 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 no. There, this is not the oppression Olympics. If you <laughs> hurt in the same way, but let's recognize there's a central problem. The central problem is whiteness that gives all white people white privilege, even the people that are victimized by that same privilege. Mm, mm. 
You know, bro, I, 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 this is why I love speaking with you. <laughs> you know what? Okay, listen here. I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the, uh, the, the ending and the tribute to our brothers and sisters. But can I mention one thing before you go? Just one thing. Just one thing. I, I was gonna say I want to give you just, the just, last just, word. Just, yeah. Just, just one other thing, and then so I'll close on this. But I see your brother Two Real O Nine said, "Who are we voting for?" And and, and I'm gonna quote my brother Colonel West. We're voting to get Trump out. I am not going to ask anyone to vote for Joe Biden. I'm going to say vote for America because that's what we're losing at this point. We're losing America. And I, I saw the brother's point and comment, and I didn't want him to get ignored because I have a special place in my heart for our formerly incarcerated. Shout out to Ephraim Marion doing really good work at Penn yes. State with our yes, formerly yes. incarcerated. Can I just can I can I can I just say this? Um, yes. I, I, I can't explain, sister, what whiteness means because I only have 10 minutes. But please do engage me on Facebook, Twitter, and I'll be happy to come back or talk about that to Sherry Bryan. Um, first, thank you for having me. Um, I really do. I appreciate it. Um, I feel privileged, honored, and blessed to be able to have this conversation. Mm. I love America. Ben Carson says, we need people to say, I, I love America. Mm -hmm. I really do. Man. I'm trying not to to tear up mm. when I say this, because the disrespect mm. of what we as black people have given to America needs to stop. Mm. And we need to recognize that, you know, of the many, many years of what we're fighting for and the many, many years of the next and the many, many needs that have been on our necks, that this is not a place of vengeance even though it could be. Yes. This is not a place of anger or fear or retribution, even though it could be. This is simply people asking for what they're entitled to. This is people asking that you acknowledge their humanity. You know, and as someone that is privileged and honored, and I'm honored to have this conversation, I wanna to say to everyone on this call, just acknowledge that. Hear us, feel us, give us the decency to not question well, is it really racism? What if you just did this? Or what about this privilege? And understand that, you know, what we're saying is real. What we're saying is time honored. And only after that, only after the reckoning has happened, and I said this at a forum at Penn State Law before I left, can true healing really begin. And this is biblical now. Until you recognize when you go to my Jewish brothers and sisters before Yom Kippur, you must first ask forgiveness for yourself. You mm -hmm. understand? Until that forgiveness is asked for and that reckoning happens, we cannot heal. We cannot heal. You know, brother, I got to tell you, I'm with you 100% on that one. I, I always say everything that I do, every presentation, every interview, every writing that I do is based in my love for this country. It's not based on trying to find revenge or trying to get back. Or, or trying to to get something that I don't that I think is old to me, but it's based on because I'm trying to hold America accountable for what its proclamations are. Mm -hmm. If you say you believe in equality, then show it. If you mm -hmm. say you believe in justice, then show it. And it's just that historically, that hasn't been the case. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. Brother, uh, you know what? If you want to hang on for the after party, maybe we could. There's so many questions pouring in. I feel bad just to say peace, people, but uh, I, I do want to be mindful of time, and I do want to get to this this tribute because I, I think it's important. Yes, well, so uh, with that said, I'm going to mute you, man, and I'll, I'll keep you on board for the after party if you want to stick around. Okay? No problem. I'm not no problem uh, sticking around and answering right, any questions that come about. You, you hear it here, folks. You got to stick around for the after party. All right. So with that said, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dwayne Wright for uh, blessing us with the, his presence and his knowledge. Uh, if we're ever going to move forward and, and progress as a people, he's absolutely right. We're going to have to do it together. And you have to be uncomfortable. I will say on a more personal note, this month I have been really angry. And yes, I've been sad. But most importantly, I have been speechless because there's the, the killings that continue to take place, not just this summer, but throughout our history. 
the generational traumas that continues to live on in our country only does because we allow it to. You know, the battle with Moses people is, is really the story of my, my great grandfather, Moses P. Cobb and my uncle Samuel Battle, uh, who were the first black police officers to have the full career in New York, uh, respectfully back in uh, 1892 and, and 1911. And the things they had to go through to earn the right to wear that badge, you couldn't understand. But yet here in 2020, we are still saying that we can't breathe. So, you know, I really want us to heal. I really want us to, to be able to come together and be able to really uh, move forward. But we can't do that as a person. We can't do that as one organization or one group. You really have to do it all together. So with that said, I want to leave you all with a gift, a tribute to Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and George Floyd. I want to thank my brother Charles Gibson for letting me use his uh, artistic uh, expression for this tribute. And uh, again, stick on for the after party, but for those who have to bounce after this tribute, I want to say remember to speak power through truth or have a great night. after party <laughs> you know what man i think we're having a good time you asked us some good questions and my mm -hmm. brother dwight is still on it and then we still have over about 70 people still <laughs> logged in <laughs> so oh, they didn't wow. go away yet <laughs> okay. thank you all for sticking around with us man you know i, I will i don't want to go too much man. This, is, this is an incredibly important conversation i don't want to rob anyone who wants to hear more or has a question that they didn't mm -hmm. feel you know, they were ready to ask from here. And, you know, I, I still know the sister that wanted to talk about whiteness, you know, please, you know, hit me up. That's a, probably a deeper conversation for another time. Um, I will put somehow my email. Um, I can do it for you right now in the chat box. If you yeah, in the chat box if anyone wants to reach out. But, you know, I'm here for at least the next 15 minutes or so. Are there any other questions, comments, reactions, concerns, um, disagreements? You know, I, anyone that knows me knows I love to hear people that disagree with me. I find that more fun. <laughs> so I always, try to, I always try to describe you just as a folks. I said the one thing I like about my brother Dwayne is that he's gonna he's gonna make your mind. He's gonna pull it back and forth. Once mm -hmm. you think you agree with something, he's gonna pull you back the other way. So I don't think you disappointed us today at all. Uh, mm -hmm. All we see right now is great jobs. Thank you, Dwayne, for your time. Um, let me see. I want to scroll real quick for some questions. Uh, uh, that, we, that we may have missed. Um, so I'm going through the thank you. 
Um, I'm, I'm sorry I made you cry. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't my, you know, I, I, I got to say, when I put together that tribute, uh, I, I was tearing up. Okay, mm -hmm. that, that's, let's be real. Um, mm -hmm. You know, art, the power of art can do something. Right? Yes, yes, amen, I, amen. I, Gotta I, lift up I, our artists. Lift up our artists right now. Exactly. Those are the murals, those painting the streets, they're part of yeah. the movement too. Right, and I, I really believe that one of the things, okay, so we had a good question here. Uh, uh, so Bernard uh, Bond has put you up there, says, how do you combat willf willful, uh, willful ignorance in today's climate? So, yeah, uh, shout out to, to Bernard Bond, my brother from another mother in Kappa Alpha Psi, all the Kappa Alpha Psi brothers in the state of Maryland. Uh, we all can make a mistake at least once, right? <laughs> on a serious note, um, how do you combat woeful ignorance? You can't allow it. You can't allow it. You know, I think, you know, I think I've heard over the last two weeks, I've got a lot of messages from white people, um, very educated white people, because unfortunately, um, outside of Savannah, I, I, I never really had interaction with a lot of white people outside of my university setting right. who claim they just don't know this, they didn't know that. And as Friendly as I am, I don't let people get away with something that both I and them know is not true. Right. You understand? Because maybe you didn't know that qualified immunity existed. I went to law school to learn that. But you <laughs> knew that if you got arrested uh, or if you were at a high school party or a college party and you got busted, the cops were going to treat you differently. Right. You knew that there was only one or two people in your class if you were a professor. You knew that if you're Penn State, your demographics when it comes to African-American males are atrocious. You understand? So the way you combat wolf of ignorance is not allowing people to escape it. So I, my Twitter has been going with stats and facts, and you've got to be willing to risk. So we just had a conversation at GW. One of the things I brought up is everyone's saying before they speak, and it was like an open forum to kind of express yourself for George Floyd, you know, I hope this is an open space. Right. Why should we not ask if it's an open and free space to talk against racism if your institution ain't racist? <laughs> so you got to keep calling people out, Bernard, and you got to make sure that you don't let people off the hook as much as you can. I'm not asking our brothers and sisters to go out their way. You understand? Yeah. But when someone comes to you and say, hey, man, we with you. Yes. What have you done in the last week? Mm. <laughs> well, mm. what have you done in the last week? Now, the answer could be I was at a protest. The answer could be, you know, I gave pro bono hours. Any protesters that need, please, you know, do, you know, hit me up. But yeah. we need to be asking each other that. What, you know, are we doing? Yeah, I posted, I, you know, sometimes I, like I like to be fun and post these sarcastic memes here and there, you mm -hmm. know. And, and, and one, you know, I sit on a lot of committees about uh, hiring committees, right? And, yeah. and one, one thing, when someone says, you know, hey, uh, we, we value diversity, equity, and inclusion, I typically go like this. How? <laughs> and if you don't, if you don't, Terry, Terry, diversity, <laughs> actually, and inclusion are the thoughts and prayers of universities. You know how people at the police <laughs> want to give thoughts and prayers? The, yes. so let me do this, and I didn't do this on the main show. Shout uh -huh. out to Penn State Law and Harry Osofsky, who I criticize a lot, but yes. when they do something good, I, I, I've seen a lot of non-performative, to go to Sarah Ahmed's non-performative theory statements that don't do anything. And she actually released last week some action items. I wish more people would do that. Stop yeah. giving me the thoughts and prayers, the diversity, yeah. equity, and inclusion. You understand? And give me some concrete action items that I can hold you responsible for. And that goes to Bernard's point as well. Absolutely. Yeah, we got uh, my sister here, Brian. Is I want to know as an educator how to balance your desire to educate white people with the beliefs that white people should educate themselves. I'm going to leave that one to you, bro. Uh, so I think that the belief that white people should educate themselves comes because white people have privilege in America and they have access to resources. The belief that I'm an educator is really a race neutral, not colorblind. Mm -hmm. so I'm always willing to educate. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. I hold people responsible when I educate. So if I'm at a forum and I see you and we talk about whiteness and we talk about it again, don't ask me that question again, because my question is going to be, what did you do between these forums? Yeah. So I think it's about, um, to say, Ari, I'm, so however you say your name, I'm sorry, it's a beautiful name. I'm terrible with those. 
Um, to, but to the question, you got to hold people accountable. Yes. You got to hold people accountable. You understand? Educate, but hold people. We do so much education, particularly in state college and a lot of you guys are from state college, without holding people accountable. How many forums, Terry, have we put on? How many diversity and equity inclusion stuff have we put on? And then when white girls put a Nazi tattoo behind their back, the university response is the First Amendment. Mm. Mm, the First I Amendment. Okay. I really want people to, if I, I know this, this is, you know, Dwayne, I don't know how we would do this, brother, but uh, people need to hear your argument of the First Amendment verse 13. Even, 14, if, I said, 14, 14, 14. even if I have that set it up myself. You know, I, I think that people don't understand the consciousness behind law. And mm. as a, a brother who is, you know, and I I, I know, I, I, I seen you when you were here at Penn State and as, as a grad student. And mm. I used to say, you know, every time you see Dwayne when he was a student, he had a book and a pen. He, he was documenting the world, right? He's documenting, he's documenting the world. Exactly. You know, I, I think people, really? <laughs> I think people understand. Now, now, Leslie Lane, my sister Leslie Lane, you know, I, you know, we, we all love Leslie, you know. Uh, yeah. she, she, she How you doing, up, Leslie? Haven't seen you in a while. I know you, I know this is ripping you apart. You know, yeah. I'm sending you thoughts and, not thoughts and prayers. I'm sending you thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> here in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland. Thank this, you, Leslie, for tuning in. Just a shout out to Leslie. Leslie was up to like one o'clock in the morning helping me advertise this. So, mm -hmm. you know, I got much love for Leslie. Uh, you know, I, I would say if you want to see what a Christian look like, look at Leslie Lane, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but you know, Le Leslie, uh, Leslie is one of uh, the, the, the people in this community who is uh, very active, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and, and I think that um, I, I appreciate you watching. So this is the after party, by the way. So you know, uh, uh, when I when I actually air this, uh, record this, the, the recording, this part won't be on it. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, so you guys are getting a little. Uh, here's the thing: we got 50 people still logged in. I know. I don't know what else. The, the what other questions you got? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm here for it. I'm here for it. But you know, you know, uh, any concerns on anything? You know, it doesn't have to be on the topic we're discussing. I happen to have a law degree and a PhD in higher education. I went to an HBCU. The, the story is long, but you know, what's on people's mind? You know, this could be a sounding board. I know people, I know, you know, some people haven't had the opportunity in a public forum to really discuss anything Aubrey, Amy Cooper, or George Floyd related. You understand? So I want to give that opportunity, you know, to just hear something or, you know, anything you want me to react to, I'm all for it. Can I can I ask you a question? Because I had a question. You know, yeah. uh, in New York now they're talking about passing a law okay. about uh, from Amy Cooper, right? Yeah. For 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 calling the police uh, making a false report. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? So I hesitate. Everyone that knows me knows this quote because I say it at every session and anywhere. And the quote is from the lovely queer black feminist Audrey Lloyd, which says mm -hmm. that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And I believe that into my soul and into my heart, you understand. Mm. So um, I, I hesitate to use the law as a tool to defeat the system of law, which was created to benefit neoliberalism, capitalism, and whiteness. Yes. However, I think there needs to be some accountability. I just, I would need to see how the bill is written. Because yeah. too often, we as black people have supported laws, the Joe Biden crime bill, <laughs> <laughs> that have turned out to be terrible for our community. So yeah. before I go out and um, say anything about a law, I want to just put that into the community and say the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. I'm yeah. all for, as a community, white, brown, coming up with alternative solutions that doesn't call using the power of the neoliberal state to try to reverse, because the system is not broken, people. The system mm -hmm. is working exactly the way it was designed to. Yeah, I said it all the time, brother. You know, okay, so this is, a, this, this is the after party, and you know, uh, Miss Bryan, here's the thing. Uh, Dr. Dwayne said that he can't say anything because it's going to, you're gonna have that trouble with his mother afterwards. I don't want to get him in trouble now. <laughs> so, but, so let me say this about Candace Owens. Let me say yeah, this on, about Candace Owens. And any person who's black, I'll throw, I'm going to get in trouble for this. I'll throw Clarence Thomas in there. I'll throw Ben Carson in there that has decided to sell themselves to whiteness for the production and use of whiteness. Mm -hmm. I don't, I believe in the First Amendment. I believe everyone has an opinion. Right. But at a certain point, when you're cooning yourself, 
you no longer have credibility with me. Mm -hmm. And Candace Owens, I, I love my sisters. I really do. I think we as black men um, and Latino men don't work hard enough to support our sisters. We don't cite them enough, et cetera, et cetera. But she's lost all credibility with me. I don't think she really believes anymore in what she's saying. I think she no longer can see a pathway out. Right. So therefore she's saying things that at this point make no sense, which if anyone watched the Dear White People um, on Netflix, it was a mm -hmm. Candace Owen like character there that was actually sympathized and decategorized and you saw a different side. That Candace Owens is even different than the Candace Owens we're seeing right now. So the reason I don't want to talk about Candace Owens is because I she has no credibility with me. Yeah, you know, I, 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 the one thing, you know, again, I don't disrespect anyone's First Amendment right or their mm -hmm. opinions, no matter how much I disagree with them, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the, I believe in energy. Energy is a point mm -hmm. thing. You know, this is the same thing. The people who was commenting, commenting on the riots mm -hmm. and the looting, but don't have the energy to, to comment on injustice. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. You yes. understand what I'm saying? Your yes. energy that you give out is important. Well, the so, people that were out there protesting to not stay in and save their own lives because of COVID, but don't want people elsewise to protest against racial violence. <laughs> Hypocrisy doesn't go very good with me. So, 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 I, I see my brother Bernard Bond has another question about what companies are putting out around Black Lives Matter. And uh -huh. I have a word that I want people to go look up. And the uh, philosopher is Sarah Ahmed. And the word is non-performativity. <laughs> and it's not about performativity, like you know, performing arts. It's yeah. when companies put out statements that don't do what they intend to do. Mm. And I think any statement that doesn't come without any action is an empty statement and it's not actually doing anything. So shout out to Apple. The day after president, the president decided to tear gas peaceful protesters, Apple shut down Apple Music. All you can listen to is hip hop for 24 seven. That's uh -huh. an action. And then we have some other companies, Popeyes, that are just putting out statements. But what are you doing? Are you hiring more people? Mm -hmm. Are your CEOs? Are you raising people's pay? So that's just my thing. Here's the thing. Watch out for the neoliberal commodification and overtake of this movement because it's happening right now it's happening everywhere and all these companies and schools too i love i love my brother eric baron i really do i think that you know he's someone that gets it but i question penn state's actions how much more money has been pumped in to our button wilder scholarships under uh, president baron how much more faculty are we hiring the brother gary king released a report which i read three years ago Mm -hmm. This year, within the last 12 months, what are we doing about it? Now, you know, we hired a few more black deans, so that's doing good, but we need to do more. You understand? Mm -hmm. So anyone that's putting out statements, we need to come with more action. Yes, I I, I, I agree. As a matter of fact, um, I was, you know, for Strategies for Justice, because I'm the founder, I did put out a statement, but my statement was short because the first paragraph is how I felt. The second paragraph is what we're doing, right? Mm -hmm. And this is a this is a good example, right? So we talked about we're doing these these episodes, we're doing these forums. Um, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I spent the whole weekend writing legislation for Buffalo. Oh wow! Uh, passing, yeah, yeah, yeah. Work, pass, passing Carrier's Law, which will protect. Listen, it, it will protect the police officer who intervenes during a beat. Yeah, because of the young lady that got fired for intervening. Yeah. Exactly. She's on my mm -hmm. show next week, right? So mm -hmm. we talked about this. You know, we asked his sister, we asked our brothers and sisters in law enforcement, and I'm, I'm saying this now, not just black, and black people, but I'm talking about all brothers and sisters in law enforcement, no matter what your race is, that if you see injustice, you have a duty to intervene. So mm -hmm. the lawyer that we are trying to get past, does just, it protects them. Send that to me, brother. I want to read it. Yeah, I, I, I we, we know what I, I can't say much more online. I'll send you some stuff. We'll talk privately about this one because got you, got you, got you. Uh, you know one of the things that uh, I, I believe in. I, I believe you, I was I was watching the uh, the hearing, uh, mm. the 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 council hearing, and yeah, yeah. you mm -hmm. could tell who supported mm -hmm. and who's giving lip service. Oh well, yeah, you can tell who's being backed into a corner. Yeah, <laughs> yes. And, and here's a message for you politicians. You listen mm -hmm. to me. Okay, get mm -hmm. off your knees. Stop kneeling. You have the power. Get off your knees and write 
<laughs> legislation. I don't want to see a politician kneeling. Okay, uh -huh. you get up. You know, I, hey, listen here. There, there was this, there was a sister that posted on social media. I can't remember her name. She said, mm -hmm. "Oh, thank you for posting Black Lives Matter." And now show me your your exec board. Uh -huh. Exactly. Right. Right. Exactly. I don't want to see another politician kneel. I don't mm -hmm. care if you're white or black, Democrat or Republican, get off your knees and do, and do your something. Job. Yeah. Do something. If anyone so, so has the power to do it, do it. I, I see a question. If we could take one more, if you don't mind, Terry. Okay. Racism can be unlearned. Um, yeah. And brother, I'll, really, I'll say this too. You answered this question, but I'm going to be mindful of your time. Uh, this is going to be the last. We got 33 people still on. <laughs> I'm, 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 you know, brother, I, I, you, you've been gracious. So I, yeah, I, no, I, have. I, got, I got a few things I need to do, but here, here's what I believe. I don't uh -huh. know. And as a researcher, I say what I know only. And as a lawyer, I say what the law is. And I don't know the law. I think the law is power. I don't know if racism can be unlearned. I think the impact of those that know racism can be mitigated, reduced, and eventually eliminated to where I don't care if racism is unlearned. Yeah. You understand? So racism in and of itself might not be able to be unlearned in the individual, but in the systemic and institutional level, we could put things in place, systems, caveats, companies, and power systems to make the fact if a human being were to unlearn racism or not, irrelevant to me as a black man living in America. So to the sister's question, I don't know, but that's what I'm striving for. A mm -hmm. point where it doesn't matter if racism is unlearned because your racism doesn't affect me, my people, and everything that goes wrong. Wow. Well, guess what? You know what? Uh, I want to thank the after party folks, 34 of you guys who stuck around. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, I know, you know, uh, we've been online for now about an hour and a half. You gotta remember me, 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 and Dwayne were on at least about 15 minutes before we actually aired. This mm -hmm. to make sure the technology works. So yeah, we got uh, full-time jobs still. <laughs> hey, we got full-time jobs. Yeah, I, you know, I got. I, I'm doing training tomorrow, so I, I gotta, I gotta oh, get my uh, stuff in yeah. order. But uh, uh -huh. hey, listen, guys, I, I want to again thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, Dwayne, I, again, I'm gonna give you the last words for the after party. Then. Yeah, man, I'll just say thank you for everyone that joined. Thank you for everyone that stayed on. I love you all. Um, any way I can help you, please hit me up, Facebook, Twitter, email, but I leave you with one challenge. Don't let this conversation, black, white, or indifferent, leave this at this conversation. Before this week is out, whatever you heard that stuck with you, whether you agreed, disagreed, anything that kept you on this conversation, try to operationalize it before Sunday. Because if one person does that, that's how we're making a better world. Whether it be voting, whether it be calling, whether it be taking this um, or for YouTube or wherever Terry's going to put it and send it to one of your friends and say, man, brother, just watch five minutes of this. Don't let this stay here. We have too many conversations where it's preaching to the choir. The choir needs to start busting out the church a little bit. Yes. In this world. So that's my challenge to everyone that's still on the call. Don't let this conversation stay here. Please don't. And, you know, uh, again, I'm, I'm going to have this conversation almost uh, every month. Uh, we go to and I'm excited for the forums mm -hmm. because you know those those sisters, that brothers and sisters that's going to be on there, they speak power to truth. You know, they are both in, in, you know uh, in law enforcement and been fighting the battle along mm -hmm. with us for mm -hmm. equity, right? Mm -hmm. But you know what? Ha I, I wrote a poem a long time ago. I said, "Beware of those who uh, also fight for justice, because uh, they they will come after you too." Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Right. Amen. So I want to make sure that we give some 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 proper due, making sure those forums are packed, because mm -hmm. this like this discussion was powerful, and you know, uh, the, the, no, the way you know, maybe uh, I don't know how we do it, but the first versus the fourteenth, uh, maybe I have you on something like this. Uh, oh yeah, you know, I'm down, man. Listen, yeah. however you need me, use me, because I'm All privileged. Right. Brother. I'm privileged. Yeah. You got to give back. You know, yes. no blessing is really a blessing unless you're willing to give it back. That's true. Well, with that said, everyone, I want you all to give uh, Dr. Dwayne from the after party there's, uh, some praise for being here. Uh, and I see the comments. They're all saying thank you. Thank you. And and, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, once this goes recorded, go, goes up, share it with folks and get the message out there that, yes, 
this conversation needs to continue. So, um, so with that said, uh, look up strategies for justice. Uh, sorry, strategiesjustice.com for future programs uh, and, and future events um, that we're doing. If you want to bring any of our speakers to your community, look at look it up. We got some great speakers on this platform who 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 are in law enforcement, who've been incarcerated, willing to share their story. So please show some love. Well. Dwayne, brother, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, brother. Thank I'm you, brother. Have some dinner. <laughs> I haven't eaten yet, so. <laughs> all right. Well, hey, hey, have a good night, and thank you all for for tuning in. I'm